Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, I know that I'm not capable of this. And that just affirms to me that you've asked me to do it. Because all power and all authority is unto you. And all glory is unto you, Lord. And it's in your name that we proclaim now, not in my name. Not in my excellence of speech or my great teaching ability, Lord. It, it, it's in the power of the truth that you rose from the dead and that all power and authority is subject to the name of Jesus because of that fact. So, Father, right now I fall upon your grace, Lord, to give me the ability to communicate and give everybody here the ability to receive. Lord, that this will be more than just the church service, but it'll be changing our lives, God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first half, what I have to do is just kind of get you, get everybody up to the same page of the book here, okay? And uh, I told you last week that I was going to give you this week five promises that are for the believer at the resurrection of our bodies. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we're going to be raised from the dead. And these are five awesome promises. Now, five in the Bible is a number that has significance. Five is the number of grace, in the Bible, five usually represents the grace of God. Five also, as you know, represents the five senses, right? We have five natural senses. So it's not a coincidence that Paul, when he talks about this natural body being changed into the resurrected, glorified body that God is going to give us, it's not a coincidence that he gives us five ways that it's going to be changed. Now, I got this image in my mind that I just... I. I I have trouble communicating it, but I think of it like, like a little seed, which is kind of the way that Paul describes it here in 1 Corinthians 15. Think of it like a little seed that you plant into the ground, and it, it's just a little seed, and it may or may not look like what it's going to become. You know, if you plant a pumpkin seed, the seed doesn't look like a pumpkin, right? But you put it into the ground, and what happens? The roots start to go down, the, the sprout starts to come up, the vine starts to spread uh, all over the ground. And that's kind of what this is like. Our bodies, when we are resurrected, we're going to be more of the good us. The bad us is going to fall away, but the good parts of us are going to remain. Actually, I'm not going to maybe I'm not going to this week. Next week, I might come back and show you some of this in scripture, but our personality is going to remain. So if you thought that you were going to lose your personality when you get resurrected, that's not biblical. Now, what you will lose is the bad parts of yourself. Amen? The bad personality flaws, the sin and stuff, but the good parts of you are still going to stay you, but you're just going to be resurrected into a better you, just like a seed the plant doesn't look like the seed. It looks like something else. But the essence of life and the personality of the seed stays the same. A acorn doesn't come back as an apple tree, right? The essence of life in the thing stays the same. And uh, the, the body that it has, Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 15, is the body that it pleased God to give it. So God is going to give us a body that pleases him. Now, Probably we're going to have very similar characteristics, just like all humans have very similar characteristics. But just like all humans don't look the same, we're not all going to look the same when we get to heaven either. We're going to have different body types, and we're going to have different personalities and all of that. So go to, down to verse number, let's say, let's start today in, in, in verse number 42 of 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, so also the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, and it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a life-giving being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man was of the Lord from heaven. As was the first man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now look at verse 50. It says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. 
mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for at the last trump for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Okay, we're going to just stop there for right now because uh, I know that, as I said last night, I'm going to say it again, we're missing big chunks of this, but we just have to eat the elephant one bite at a time here. So let's just start here. Paul gives us in this passage that I just read five ways that your physical body right now is going to be transformed into a spiritual body. These are promises. Now, listen, I, I would trust these promises more than you would trust a plastic surgeon. <laughs> All right, have you seen people that have just had too much plastic surgery in your life, right? Okay, I would trust these promises because the surgeons don't always know what they're doing, but God knows what he's doing and he's the great physician and God promised us these things. Okay, God promised that those that believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are going to get their physical uh, resurrection we're going to be raised up anew just like jesus was and he says you're going to get these five things first of all he says you're going to go from perishable to imperishable from perishable to imperishable how many of you know that this body is wasting away from the moment that a baby is conceived in the womb we like to say that baby's growing up but actually that baby's biological clock just started ticking and we don't want to be a pessimist but let's be real about it that baby's going to die now, the baby may die in the womb uh, as a stillborn, or the baby may grow to be a 120-year-old man or woman, but that baby is still in decay from the moment that it is conceived. It begins to decay. This body is in decay. It's a corruptible body. It's subject to ruin. It's subject to perishing. It's going to pass away. Uh, the, the Bible says that we're but a vapor. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. But the Bible says that we are going to be raised up imperishable. The body that we're going to receive will not perish. It will not fade away. It will not be subject to sickness and disease. Amen? That's what we're looking for. Now, we believe that Jesus is the healer. Not only did Jesus physically heal many, and that was the, uh, the backbone of his ministry was physical healing to provide evidence the who he was and physical healing is still in the atonement today the same blood of jesus that forgave our sins heals our bodies amen? amen and physical healing is still evidence that jesus is the lord today jesus is still in the healing business but when we receive healing today what we're really receiving is the first fruits of the ultimate healing that's going to come because even if you're healed today guess what you're still going to die Unless Jesus returns before then, you're still going to die, right? Now, Lazarus, Jesus raised him from the grave after four days after he stinketh, the Bible says. All right? After four days, Lazarus rose from the dead. Lazarus was not resurrected. Lazarus was resuscitated. And there's a difference. Because Lazarus retained his regular earthly body. And Lazarus, guess what? He died again. And Lazarus isn't coming up again until we come up again. I mean, as far as his body, his spirit's with the Lord, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But Lazarus did not have his resurrected body. He had his resuscitated body. And because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, he had full authority to uh, put life into that. Now, I, again, I don't want to... I got This is such a, a big topic. It's hard not to, to drift a little bit here. But we will receive the body as it pleases God. Now, some people find it hard to believe, and it's always one of the arguments that you hear. Well, how is God going to bring the particles back from the ocean, you know, or, or you know, the, the, the believer that was fed to the lions, you know, and the particles became part of the lion of their body, and how is God going to separate the lion DNA from the human DNA, and how is God going to do, do this and all that? Well, that's really kind of a stupid question, because if you think about this, God had power to create our bodies in the first place. So if God had power to create us in the first place, why wouldn't he have the same power to fix us or to recreate us again? So it's really kind of a dumb argument, but yeah, it is. we should address it because it is something that comes to mind. But this natural body, I don't care uh, if you got the faith of Oral Roberts, I don't care if you know you got a, a, an incredible healing ministry, and if we believe 100% in the healing blood of Jesus, this body, unless Jesus returns before we die, this body is perishing. 
It's on the downhill slope. And, and uh, that's why we have such a great hope that we're going to be raised up imperishable. Then he says that we're going to go from mortality to immortality. Mortality to immortality. Now that has a lot uh, to do with not aging, of course. Um, but not, not being mortal. And, and some of the Bible translations interchange these words, by the way. So if you're reading it and you're not seeing the exact words, you should probably uh, uh, just try to follow along the best you can. I'm mostly coming out of the NIV, but crossing over to the King James Version sometimes here. But we're going to go from mortal to immortal. Life without end. Now, aren't you glad that the, the immortal part of us, we're going to be transformed, number two, into being immortal. And aren't you glad that that part of us is tied to the imperishable part? of us because wouldn't it be terrible to have a body that's perishing and yet to live on in immortality and that's the very reason that God put Adam out of the garden of Eden that's the very reason that he put him out because he said I don't want him to eat from the tree of life and you see some people say well God is unmerciful he, he put Adam and Eve out of the garden of Eden after they they made their little sin no God was very merciful because once sin came into the world death came into the world which again he talks about in this chapter that that uh, the sting of death is sin sin is what allows sin is what ushers death into this world and so God put Adam and Eve out of the garden because they would could you imagine if Adam and Eve were still alive today how, how old and decrepit their bodies would be but if they had to keep on living, that would be miserable. And so sometimes people say, are we going to be like Adam was before the fall? And the answer is no, we're not. Because Adam never fully consummated that relationship with God through eating from the tree of life. The Bible talks many places about the tree of life, which is a topic for another time because I'm trying to move along here. But, but because we have imperishable, imperishable bodies, God is going to couple that along with giving us immortal bodies, uh, bodies that, that never end. Again, I'm, for deeper stuff on this, look up the YouTube video that is uploading right now. It'll be up there later today. We're going to go from dishonor to glory, from dishonor to glory. What was sown in dishonor, he says in verse 43, is raised in glory. Well, this is a dishonorable body, isn't it? This body just doesn't always do what I tell it to do. You know, uh, sometimes you just, you know, sometimes when I'm preaching, I belch at the wrong time. Isn't that, that that's so embarrassing. It's so dishonorable, right? You know, uh, sometimes, you know, you can put in your, your finest clothes and get halfway through the day and say, doggone it, I forgot deodorant. <laughs> That's a dis dishonorable body. I remember one time, I don't know why this is coming to mind, just silly stuff does when I'm preaching. And I was watching, you know, one time the news, this was on a live news broadcast, and the guy had like the spittle thing, you know, like the wet spots under his armpits, and the anchor lady said, you need to take care of that. She said it right on live TV, and the guy was pretty upset about it, you could tell. But this is a, this is a, dis <laughs> like I said, I don't know why that came to mind. This is a dishonorable body, man. It does dishonorable stuff. And let me tell you, the best among us, it does dishonorable stuff, right? We, we lack coordination, we, we lack thoughts, we, you know, make obnoxious sounds when we're not expecting to. We maybe lisp, lisp or have a poor memory or a bald spot. This, this body is full of dishonor, but our new body is going to be full of glory. Now, the word glory there is the word doxa. That's the same glory that's used to describe God. We're not going to be God. We're never going to be as big as Jesus like Audio Adrenaline used to sing, but we're going to be like God. Okay, We can be like God without being God. And we're going to be like God. I believe we're going to glow. We're going to have brightness. But it isn't just glowing. Doxa also means honor, glory, excellence, and dignity. This dishonorable body is getting traded. Oh, praise God. Amen. You all think it's funny to laugh at me. But, but, but you know, you think it's funny to laugh at your preacher. I know how you are. That's okay. I can take it. But there's coming a day when I'll preach a sermon and never miss a beat. You know what I'm saying? So I won't have to. I won't sweat like T.D. Jakes. And, you know, I won't, won't stammer like R.W. Shambach. I mean, I'll just preach that thing, man. Because this dishonorable body is going to be traded for an honorable body. Hallelujah. It's going to go from weakness to power. From weakness to power. How many of you know this body is weak? Now, there are some people that are gifted with a lot of strength, but 
they're still weak. If you think about it, their bodies fail. And sometimes weakness comes upon our body and we're just not as strong as we used to be. But the Bible says that that's going to be transformed to power. That's the word dunamis, which is actually miracle power, might, miraculous power, its ability. So our new bodies, our resurrected bodies, we're, we're going to have power. Now, we're going to have, uh, the other Greek word is exousia for power, which is authority. We're going to have that kind of power too. But it's talking about dunamis power here. Might, power explosive power um, you know presence and charisma but also physical strength that's all included right here and then the most important one of these number five which kind of encapsulates the rest is he says in verse 44 that this body is sown a natural body but it's raised a spiritual body now he's using very specific words there the word for natural that your Bible probably translated it natural. It might have said, it might say earthy. But your natural body is actually the word psyche in the Greek. It's a psyche body. It's a body with mind, will, and emotions. Now, you may not have known it, but you're a psychic. Everybody's trying to be a psychic, but you're a, you're a psychic, okay? Really, no kidding. That's what the, exactly what the word is, psyche or psych. It's a, it's a mind. It's the mind, the will, the emotions, all right? And... Um, we're going to come back to that in just a minute. But we were born a psyche body, and we are raised a spiritual body. Now, the word for spiritual there is pneuma, which is the word for breath and life and, and Holy Spirit himself. Okay, uh, in verse 47, the natural body is called dust of the earth. And in verse 47, the spiritual body is called the heavenly man. So just to illustrate what this is saying, basically, is that even though we got saved on this earth, we're saved. It's a definite action that happens. When you believe upon the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you confess your sins and believe upon the Lord Jesus, you are saved. Amen? If you died that moment after you believed him, you would go to heaven. Amen? We believe that. But also, we know that we're not perfect yet, right? We're still being sanctified. See, and here's where the problem comes in in this natural life. We're, as for a believer, we're saved, but we still have a lot of psyche in us, a lot of mind, will, and emotions in us. And, and before we're saved, the mind, the will, the emotions, the psyche is in the driver's seat. It's in the driver's seat. You know, the psyche says, I want a hamburger. It goes and gets it. The psyche says, oh, that girl looks good. He goes and gets it. The psyche says, man, I wonder what that dope feels like. The psyche goes and gets it. You're driven. You're not driven by the spirit. You're driven by your mind, your will, your emotions. That's your psyche. Then you get saved, and what happens is a, a new passenger gets into the car. Amen. And what he does is he starts trying to take over the driver's seat. It's like having a 16-year-old in your car, all right? You haven't matured in, in the things of the spirit yet. That's why the Bible is always trying to teach us to not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the spirit. And actually in Romans chapter eight, when it talks about walking according to the spirit, it uses a specific word called weos, which means mature son of God. In, in ages past here, we talked about this, being a weo son, a mature son of God. The Bible, when it, when it references Christians as that, it also talks about Jesus as that. That's a little different. But when it talks about Christians as a weos, son of God, in Romans chapter 8, it's talking about a, a person that is led by the Spirit. The mark of maturity for a Christian is not how much you go to church, how much you tithe, how much you do whatever. The mark of maturity for a Christian is are you led by the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit in the driver's seat? You see, but here's the problem. Because we got so much psyche still in us and we're being saved as well as being saved, Let's be real. Isn't the mind, will, and emotions in the driver's seat a lot of times? And we got that little thing called the conscience in the back seat saying, hey, don't go there. Don't do that. Don't do that. Well, here's what's going to happen. This natural body that is psyche-driven is going to be changed. And in eternity, when we get our resurrected bodies, it's the spirit that's going to be in the driver's seat. And you're still going, it doesn't mean you're going to be a floating spirit. That's not what this word spirit means. Like you lose all materiality. We know that because Jesus had physical substance. The angels could take on physical substance. The Bible teaches we'll be like Jesus and like the angels. But it doesn't mean you just become like this floating spirit out in the mist in your new body. You're still going to have physical substance. What Paul is teaching us here is that the spirit is going to be in the driver's seat. So when... The flesh, if the flesh, 
which it won't because it'll be in total subjection and, and it'll be defeated because of the blood of Jesus. But if the flesh were able to rise up and say, oh, that look at that, that over there, the spirit would say, sit down and shut up and get in the back seat. Amen. Yeah, right? The spirit is going to be in the driver's seat. Isn't it going to be great when you're free? Look, let me tell you, man has one problem. I don't mean just man. I mean man and woman. They got one problem. It's called sin. Amen. And I don't care if, if you're the most sanctified believer on this earth. When you get saved, you're a saint, but you're a saint that still has the capacity to sin. The flesh gets in the driver's seat sometimes. Isn't that going to be a wonderful day? Oh, man. When we get to pack this hot body around without having the flesh in the driver's seat. Isn't that going to be a wonderful day? Oh, praise God. Holy Ghost is in the driver's seat all the time. And that's what he says. We're going to be changed. We're going to be changed. Amen? Now, remember, uh, God is, is, is spirit now, that doesn't mean God doesn't have physical substance. He has very definite physical substance because uh, Jesus said, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in me. And Jesus had physical substance. He was a man. God became man. He put on human, human flesh. God, God has physical substance, but God is a spirit, the Bible says. And so the way that God communicates to us is through spirit. Now, God being the creator of all things means that he can communicate to us any way that he wants to. He could speak to us through sight, through hearing, through you know, taste, through smelling, through touch. He could communicate any way that he wants, but he chooses not to. The way that God speaks to us is through the Spirit. Amen. Spiritual things, the Word says, are spiritually discerned. That's why when we're changed, there's never going to be a miscommunication anymore because we're all going to be in the Spirit. There's going to be no miscommunications. We're all going to be spiritually led. And this, this uh, body is going to be in subjection. The new body, not this body, the new one that we get. Well, gee, I would like to spend more time there, but we just have to go on. Okay? So look at verse 46. He says, The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. And just as uh, we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, while we could spend a long time on that, I'm not going to do it today. That teaches us a couple very basic things. First, Paul says the natural comes first. That answers a lot of questions if you think about it. But first, we've got to backtrack and get into the mind of Paul here. Okay, what does Genesis 1-1 tell us? Remember Genesis 1-1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, he created the heavens first, right? And the book of Hebrews also tells us that the natural things or the physical things are created out of spiritual things. The things which are seen are created out of the unseen. Okay, so, you know, you look and you say, well, you know, uh, I'm into logic and this pew in front of me is, is very hard and it has a soft cushion on it and I'm in, in to logic. Well, there is a higher reality to that pew and that cushion from the spiritual realm that allowed it to enter into the physical realm. The spiritual comes first and then the physical because all of the physical is out of the spiritual realm. So you're saying, Pastor, you're contradicting the Bible. No, just work with me here. How could Paul say this? How could Paul say the natural comes first and then the spiritual when Paul probably wrote the book of Hebrews. We don't know, but he probably wrote that too and said that all the seen things are made out of the unseen. So is he double talking? What is Paul doing here? Well, there's a very simple solution. Right here, you got to realize the vantage point. Paul is coming from our vantage point here. We're the seed that is planted that is going to become the mighty oak. We're the, the little nut. You're the little nut. <laughs> Everyone say, I'm a little nut. You know, I just wanted to hear you say that was the only purpose of that. Okay, you're the little nut that when you're planted is going to become the mighty oak. Okay, so from the little nut's perspective, the natural comes first because I'm going to become this. And Paul is talking about from our perspective. Okay, we are natural right now, but we are not the end product. Nobody is. Everybody's a seed. Everybody's going to be resurrected, all of the dead. And, and if the Lord keeps us here in a week or two, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about how there's a resurrection unto life, but there's also a resurrection unto death. Yes. We're all the seed. Both sides are important. I love what, what uh, uh, Derek Prince said. He said, I wrote three books on the resurrection. The first two were bestsellers, and the third one was about the judgment. I couldn't sell any of them. 
So <laughs> he said, it's out of print now. I couldn't sell any of them. So, you know, but, but we're kind of geared that way, aren't we? But you got to have, have the whole package. So Paul is talking from our perspective. The natural comes first. This is what I am now. But if you don't like me now, just come back and see me in a couple thousand years because I'm going to look a lot different. And how do you, I'm going to say, how you like me now? Because you're going to like me. Because all of the bad parts of David Fox are going to fall off. My personality is going to remain. My, my sanctified likes and dislikes are going to remain. My, my God-honoring parts are going to remain. The parts that love people and love Jesus are going to remain. But all that bad stuff is going to fall off and it's going to be like the old hollow seed that falls off the leaf of the plant, right? When the plant, when the plant uh, grows. So he's talking from our perspective. The spiritual did come first, but from our perspective, the natural came first. Now, this is important because this answers an age-old question, when does life begin? If you just want to simply believe what the Bible says and have faith, it answers that question. Life begins at conception because the natural comes first. Because there is a teaching which you know, people aren't going to go to hell that believe this, but there is a teaching that says that our spirits are kept in heaven and then they enter our body and then they return to heaven to go back to be with the Lord. And there's a lot of really good Christians that believe that. I'm going to be honest, I kind of played around with that for a little bit because there are some places where it looks like that could be possible where the wording's not clear and stuff. But this is a powerful passage of the scripture because it answers this. The natural comes first. Life begins at conception. When, when the sperm and the egg came together, that became a living being and God gave it a spirit. Your spirit began then. Because also this passage says that, that God, you know, speaking of the resurrection, we're going to have the body that pleases the Lord. Amen? So life begins at conception. It answers that, that uh Query or that, that inquiry. Okay, so now we're going to kind of um, abruptly shift gears here. Okay, we're going to abruptly shift gears and think of this as not like, uh, while it may not be, you know, a strict five point sermon this morning, it's all about the resurrection and our resurrected bodies, and, and we're eating it one bite at a time. Think of it like a, like a seven course meal, okay? So you've just had that one, that part. Now we're bringing out, out the, next, the next dish, the next entree to eat that is connected. This is all interconnected. Okay, so why is it so important to spend more time learning about and preaching on the resurrection? It's not just because we're excited about the new bodies we're going to get, though there's nothing wrong with that. We should be completely excited about this, that. But God unlocked a mysterion to me, a secret to me. Now, he's kind of touched on this before, but this morning he unlocked it to me fresh. So you want fresh stuff? This is really fresh, okay? This is as fresh as you can get. The, the bread just came out of the oven at like about 5 o'clock this morning, all right? This is fresh stuff. Um, even though we've kind of danced around it before, there is a mystery in the resurrection. There is a missing key, a secret to your life that you probably have overlooked. I'm going to be honest with you. You've probably overlooked it or we probably haven't emphasized it enough and we're going to try to correct that. Okay, if you're a Christian in this place today and you want to live holy, raise your hand. Okay, if you're a Christian in this place and you struggle to live holy because you still got flesh in you, raise your hand. <laughs> Here's a secret to holy living. Here's a secret to holy living, the preaching of the resurrection. And I'm going to show you this. This is biblical. I'm going to show you this. So this is taking, now it's not the only key, okay? I mean, we got the Holy Spirit. His first name's Holy. He helps us live holy. But this is one of the primary things that is lacking. Why is the church of America so unholy right now? Well, let me ask you a question. Do they hear a message about the resurrection more than once a year or twice a year? So everyone says, we want to bring holiness. You know, we want to bring clean, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to, you know, look like rascals out on the street and then come say hallelujah in church. Everyone, we want to clean up. We want to get better. We want to see the results in our life. You know, we believe that Jesus forgave our sins, but we want to see the results of it. Well, there's a mystery here. There's a secret here in the resurrection that we're going to unlock right now in these, in these last few minutes of church. Okay, let's start in 1 Corinthians 15 verse number 33, okay? 
And, and this is a bigger topic, again, than we're going to be able to adequately do today, but we're going to do our best. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. He says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God, and I say this to your shame. Now, what I just read was out of the NIV. The King James says, awaken unto righteousness. Come back to your senses. Awaken unto righteousness. Snap out of it, man. Like in those old movies where the... Now, we, we don't do this nowadays, don't worry. I would get beat up. But like in those old movies where the woman's spazzing out and the guy... <coughs> snap out of it, woman, and she snaps out of it. That's not an appropriate illustration nowadays, I know. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> if that ever happened, if I ever did that, I'd be waiting for my resurrection. <laughs> that I know, right, honey? So, uh, anyway, um, geez, I can get in trouble on any sermon. Okay, <laughs> praise the Lord. Okay, so come back to your senses. Snap out of it. Stop sinning. Now, that seems out of place. But Paul's on to something here, and we're going to see it other places in the New Testament. Paul is on to something here. Because while I didn't read that whole passage, Paul here is dealing with people that don't believe in the resurrection, where he says this. They're dismissing the resurrections. As I've said before, some of them were Sadducees, and they're Sadducee because they don't believe in the resurrection. Others, they just, you know, they're like, they said, well... You know, we love the Jesus thing. We love that Jesus lived a good life and he was a holy man and we love all of that, but we're just not into that raising from the dead stuff. Well, he says also in these passages that if you don't believe Jesus rose from the dead, you're still dead in your sins. So let me, let me, let me uh, teach you something that seems harsh, but it's as biblically true as you can get. When you meet a believer that says, I believe in Jesus, I just don't believe he rose from the dead, they're not a true believer. Because if you don't believe Jesus rose from the dead, you are still dead in your sins. The Holy Spirit quickens that to you. Just like we know Jesus is coming back and people say you're crazy. And you only think I'm crazy because you're not saved. Because the Holy Spirit quickens that to your heart. It becomes part of your identity. You know it when you get saved. You know that you know. Because the Holy Spirit quickens that, that uh, into your heart. So Paul is dealing with people here that they either don't believe in the resurrection or they're being dismissive of the resurrection or they're trying to find a way around it because you know how people are when they like Jesus but they don't like the controversy. And there's going to be controversy and persecution if you really believe in Jesus. So Paul says to them, hey, snap out of it, man. <laughs> Snap out of it. Uh, I, I'm saying this to your shame. Uh, come to your senses. Stop sinning. When you begin to understand that we're not just living in the here and now, we're all headed somewhere, and we're going to answer for it. Yes. Now, I don't, some people, I don't want to go too heavy on this at times because some people have taken it too far. But for all those people that think I'm too much of a love preacher, now's the time for you to listen. Because Paul says in another place, to Christians, wherefore knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. <laughs> Where, think of those word, that words, wherefore knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. In other words, I'm getting my butt out of the church pew and I'm telling people because I'm going to have to answer to God one day and he ain't going to be happy if I missed all my opportunities. Amen. Okay, a little bit of healthy reverence and respect is a good thing. I don't know what it is about us that makes us think that we're invincible and that we can't die and that we have forever. Now, look, I don't want to be mean, but some people sitting here are 80 years old. How many years do you think you got left? I mean, really? I mean, I, I'm 44, but I don't, I'm not promised today. I'm believing God for many more years. But I'm not promised today or tomorrow. I'm promised this, this moment. Amen? I mean, if I live another... 50 years, that's a good old life, but that really isn't that much in the scheme of things. And Paul is saying, hey, snap out of it, man. <laughs> get your, get your, you know, your face out of the magazine and turn off the TV and, and get out of all your cowardice and your fear and snap out of it, man. Awaken unto righteousness. Wake up. Realize that you're not going to live forever. 
You're not going to live forever, and we're going to give an account. The Word says, now this is very scary, yes, but it says that we're going to give an account for the foolish things that we have spoken, speaking to believers. Now, the good side of this coin is that God is merciful, amen, and that God's not going to disown us and cut us off because He's a faithful God, amen. If we believe in Jesus, He's not cutting us off, and that we can be saved by fire. The words, Do you really want to be saved by fire? Think about that. Okay. But mm, awaken unto righteousness. One of the reasons that the church and us personally, let's make it personal, lack holiness is because we've lacked a focus on the resurrection. We're all being raised. The sinners that die without Christ are being raised unto judgment. And we're going to get into that. Eternal damnation in hell. Be not because God put them there, but because they made a choice to go there. Christians are still going to be raised to a judgment, and it's not going to be heaven or hell, but the stakes are still pretty high. And, and I don't know, but there, there's a reason that if I tell Mercy, you better stop it or I'm going to spank you. Mercy's my daughter. I'm, I better clarify that since her name is Mercy. Mercy's my daughter. If I say, Mercy, I'm going to spank you. No, 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 no. And she runs through a room or whatever, right? There's a reason for that. Because she knows it's not going to feel good. How good do you... Yeah, I get it. He's not going to disown us and we're not going to get thrown into hell if we're a believer. But how good do you think it's going to feel if God has to give you a spanking? I mean, could you imagine what would happen to the planet Pluto if God just gave it a little flick? Oh, help me, Jesus. I mean, that, that sounds funny, but, uh, but we need some healthy fear of the Lord. Healthy fear of the Lord, once again. Yes, he's merciful, but okay, let's go to a couple verses. Like I said, this is a hard, we got to do this with balance. We really do. And it's hard to get this whole subject in, in one message. But go over to 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. Another passage I'd like to read more, but we really got to shorten it down here for the sake of time this morning. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. Apostle John now, not Paul. Apostle John. He says, Dear friends, now we are children of God. Everyone say, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. If Jesus is in your heart, you're a child of God. So it's pretty clear who he's talking to there. Dear friends, we are now children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. Well, not fully is what that means. We know in part, and we see in part, the Bible says in another place, but we don't fully know what it's going to be like. How could you explain to a caterpillar what he's going to be like as a butterfly? You can't fully explain it. You can just do your best with it. But we don't fully know what we're going to be, but we have some indication. He says, but, this is what we do know, but... We do know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now look at verse number three. This is the key. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. The hope and the, not just the hope of, but the imminent, undeniable certainty of the fact that no matter how long you live, this life is coming to an abrupt end one of these days, and you're going to answer to God. Now, John says that that's actually a hope, because as a believer, that's a good thing. Because I'm the, there are some sins. Can I just be honest that I'm still human? Oh, dear Jesus. Don't say amen, Leon. I'm just kidding. I'm still human. Can I, can I just be honest about that? And you may say, Pastor Dave, there are some things we hate about you. Well, join the club. There are some things I hate about myself. And I'm looking forward to Jesus coming. But, but to be obstinate and rude and foolish and to say, well, God, I'm just going to keep this repulsive thing that I know you hate. And I know I'm going to get a big spanking for it when you catch me. But I'm just going to keep it in my life anyway because I like it. That would really make you question your fear of the Lord. Amen. Healthy fear of the Lord. Uh-huh. Because what, you know, what, what's going to happen if, uh, what's going to happen if uh, you're a healthy family and your teenage son is hiding a bunch of drugs and pornography in his room? Mine isn't. I'm just using, I'm not picking on them. And you walk in and you find it. There's going to be a healthy discussion, and it's not going to feel good, right? 
because you're going to lose your phone, you're going to lose your car, you're going to lose whatever else, right? You might be in military academy. Who knows where, where you might be, right? But, but what if the kid had the attitude, he's not going to disown me, he's my dad anyway. You can pretty much guarantee that that kid is getting shipped away to school somewhere for troubled kids, right? Well, God's not going to disown us, but we think it would be so foolish to have that attitude towards our father. Let me tell you, true story. I didn't get in a lot of trouble as a kid. I really didn't, by the grace of God. My brother's gotten enough for me. But one time I was fighting with my brother that's older than me, and my dad told me to stop or something, and I went around the corner of the house. I didn't know my dad was still there, and I said a very foul curse word, and my brother was standing there. <sighs> And my dad was around the corner, but it was my brother that heard me, actually. And he went back. You know what he did immediately, right? Dad, 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 guess what David did? <laughs> it wasn't a happy day. My dad's a nice guy, but it wasn't a happy day, okay? Um, don't think that just because we're kids, you know, what a rude, disrespectful attitude. But we got a lot of that in our culture, don't we, these days? Now, look, this is... Uh, uh, look at verse number three again. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Actually, it's almost universally agreed upon, and some of your translations have fixed this already, that the word in should be on. And that's an, it seems like just a two-letter word, but that's an important thing. Read it now. All who have this hope on him purify themselves just as he is pure. In other words, our hope is not in our own efforts to get pure or to get right. Our hope is on him but because we love him and because we appreciate what he's done for us, we're going to do everything we can to get pure. It's called practical holiness. Now, there's imputed holiness, and that's what saves us. Our righteousness is imputed. Our own righteousness is filthy rags. But there is such a thing as practical holiness, right? Practical holiness is the manifestation of imputed holiness. Why do I feel bad when I disrespect or do wrong to some other person and I realize it? Because the imputed holiness that is within me, that is the gift of God that I didn't work for, convicts me when my practices don't line up with it. Right? It's the imputed holiness that saves us, but if it's really in us, it's going to affect how we treat other people. You can't say you believe something and never... Do it. You don't really believe it. What you really believe is how you act. You act like, like you really believe. Now, this seems like a hard message, but th this is what we need, man. Well, part of what we need, not all of it, but it's one of the missing keys. Now, it's, you say, well, pastor, that don't sound very loving. It's completely loving because all of our hope is on him, on him. He who has this hope on him purifies himself just as he is pure. I want to get as much like Jesus as I can on this earth. That's part of the reason that he left me here. He didn't just save me and zap me out of here because he left me here to continually be sanctified. I love how Pastor Mary said years back, and I still remember this. She said, we're not just preparing for a wedding, we're preparing for a marriage. I mean, how does the bride prepare? You know, it, it, I mean, the, if the bride, you know, just bought a nice wedding dress but didn't take a bath for six months before the marriage, you'd think something's wrong there didn't get her hair done, you know, uh, you know, didn't put a little bit of makeup on, not that you have to have makeup, but I'm saying because you're preparing for the marriage and you love the person, don't, don't you want to just do your best to prepare for the marriage, not just for, for the wedding? Well, anyway, I need to go on. We're wrapping it up. Don't worry. Uh, but I want to show you this is a missing key. If you really want to work some of the kinks out of your life, some of the sins out of your life, some of the difficulties out of your life, then sink your teeth down in to our hope, and it is a hope, not a punishment, our hope of the resurrection. The fact that when he appears, we're going to be made like him. We're going to be made like him. Well, look at, I want to show you one. I never noticed this verse before, but go to Acts 24, verse 15 and 16. I love discovering new things in scriptures. Go to Acts 24, verses 15 and 16. This is when Paul is on trial before Felix. Okay, Paul is on trial before Felix. And they're accusing Paul of all kinds of stuff. And Paul is basically, I mean, just summarizing this, he's basically saying, look, these people that are accusing me, who were the Pharisees, he's saying, I believe like they believe. The only difference is, is that I believe Jesus is the Messiah. <laughs> 
You know, one time I saw this uh, show, I can't remember what it was, it was a documentary about some artist from New York, and for about a third of the show, I thought, this guy is good, this is, this is amazing, these are Christian ideas, this is Christian art, this is good stuff, and about a third of the way through the show, he started believing, well, I don't believe in Jesus, I believe in whatever it was, and that just swept everything away didn't it? That just swept, swept everything away. Paul believes, Paul was a Pharisee. He believed everything the Pharisees believed with one exception, and it was a very important one, that Jesus was the Messiah and that Jesus was the fulfillment of it. Amen? And he says here in verse 15 of Acts 24, and I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Everyone say the righteous, the righteous. And, the and the wicked. Now look at verse 16. This ought to convict every believer in the house. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. You know, the solution to the messed up one of the solutions, one of the very big ones, that to the messed up church in America, to the sinful church in America, to the carnal worldly church in America, is a healthy dose of remembering. Every one of us is going to answer to God. There is coming a resurrection unto life or unto death. And believers are going to answer to God. Jesus told the parable of, of the mina or the talents where he said he gave the one, one talent. He gave, uh, what was it, two to one, and he gave five to one. Is that what it was? One, two and five, I think. And the one with five went out and he doubled it. The one with two went out and he doubled it. And God said to them, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my rest. But the one with one, he just buried it and put it in a hole. And Jesus said, get out of my sight, you wicked, unfaithful servant. You know what the difference was between the, ones, the, the one that had two and the one that had five and the one that had, had one was? The one that had one was looking that he only had one and he wasn't seeing the master as he really was. He was letting his false conceptions of who the master really was dictate how he was using the one thing. If you only got one thing, praise God you got one thing because some people got nothing. Use it for the master. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Paul said, I strive. It's my effort. Now, let's go one more place. I, we're trying to wrap it up. Okay, we got three minutes, and we'll still be out on noon, so you pray for me. We might make it, okay? Go to 2 Timothy 17, 21. I want to show you the other side of this. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is dealing with people that don't believe in the resurrection, okay? They don't believe. And yet we see that a healthy belief that you're going to be raised from the dead into eternity will uh, will affect your life. Those that don't believe are still dead in their sins. You better start believing it because you're going to answer to God whether you believe it or not. Then we went to Acts where Paul was testifying about people that believed just like he did, but, he, but they didn't believe that Jesus was the resurrection and the life. They believed in doctrine like he believed. Let me tell you, there's a lot of people in the church that believe the same doctrine as us, but God's not so impressed with our theories of holiness. He wants to see practical holiness lived out in our lives. Mm. Feel the Holy Ghost. God forgive us. Now Paul's going to deal with the other extreme. Those that said the resurrection already happened. How many of you know there's all kinds of people in the world? Look at verse 17 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. They're teaching, and I'm cutting this short on purpose. Okay, they're teaching will spread like gangrene among those who are Hymenus and Pilethus who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Now, I wish I had time to go back to 1 Corinthians 15 this morning and, and build more of a case on this. Uh, how the your your view of the resurrection of Jesus and yours which will follow, because he's the first fruits and 
we're following in his footsteps. Your view on the resurrection is of such import to your faith. Some people say, well, I would like to increase in faith. Well, take a good look at the resurrection because in every one of these cases, we see that our view of the resurrection is tied to our faith. In the one case, they didn't believe and they were dead in their sins. They lacked faith, he says. And in, in, in another case, they believed like he believed, but they didn't accept Jesus. So they were still condemned. And in this case, they said, the resurrection has already happened. Too late for you, right? Too late for you. And, and it doesn't fully explain this, but it says that they destroy the faith of some. The resurrection is so crucial to your faith. Verse 19 says, nevertheless, nevertheless. Oh, I love that. That means it doesn't matter what... It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what God's word is. Well, I believe, tough luck. This is what God's word says. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn from wickedness. Amen. Abraham Lincoln said you can fool some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all the time. You can't fool God at all. Amen? God knows those that are his. God knows if we're just struggling and we're looking forward, hopefully, for that day when we're going to be made like him and sanctified, or if we're just trying to hide a bunch of sins in the nooks and crannies and some of it out in the open. Well, verse 20, in a large, look, look, this, this is a good theology right here in verse 20. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of, of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and other are for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes made holy, made holy and made useful to the master prepared for any good work. Sometimes you look at some people and you say, why do they get all the breaks? Sometimes, and you've got to have discernment, this isn't always the case, but sometimes the person that you think is getting all the breaks is a person that in spite of their flaws and faults, they're doing their best to work out holiness in their lives before the Lord. And God is just a merciful God. Amen? And he says that one wants to be on the team. Have you ever played a sport where there were some people that wanted to be on the team and some that their parents made them be on the team? <laughs> Church is kind of like that. Christianity is kind of like that, but God knows who's really on the team. And the ones that want to be there, you know, it's our works do not save us. The grace of God saves us. But because we're so thankful to the Lord for what he's done, because we get it, then we're going to strive for perfection. We're going to we're going to shoot for the highest purposes and the special purposes. And I don't know, I, I just, you know, I saw this... Uh, in basic training, it's been years since I went through, and I was never very good at the, the sit-ups or push-ups or running. <laughs> That's all of it. I was never very good at that stuff. But, you know, you could really tell the two categories of people, and I guarantee they're still there in every class, the ones that care what the minimum are and the ones that don't care. Because the ones that don't care, they're going to just do it until they're out. And the ones that care, they're struggling to get 30 push-ups or whatever it is, Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> what, but everybody wants to know what the limit is, right? What's the cutoff? But the ones that are really all in are the ones that they're not looking for the minimum limit. limit. They're just going to go till their body quits. It's just a fact of life. I wonder how many of us are looking for the minimum limit and how many of us are just going to go until this body quits for the Lord. Amen? Amen. I know it's a hard message. I know it's uh, hard well, Paul uses some graphic language, and we are wrapping up here on a, hopefully a more positive note, but, but uh, it's all important. He says here that, you know, there, there's stuff for different purposes. Some is, is common purposes, some is special purposes. What do you want to be, the everyday silverware, the paper plates? Paper plates are great, but if you got a dignitary or someone famous coming over, you're not putting out the paper plates, right? What, what, what do you want to be in God? What do you want to be? The guy that, that God just looks at is disposable. Look, I know they're saved, but they're not really on the team. And they're just like paper plates. We're going to accept them because they have a purpose and I love them. Or do you want to be the special instruments? 
the special dishes that God uses. Now, back in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, I overlooked this, but it, it, it kind of fits here, where Paul is saying, you know, stop sinning, and he's saying, good, he's saying bad company corrupts good character. Be careful who you hang around with. Now, those words there, now Paul sometimes uses very graphic language. People get after preachers if they talk like Paul, and I don't mean that he cussed, but Paul would use the strongest language of his day without cussing that he could use. And, and that's one of the places he's kind of rattled in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, where he says, bad company corrupts good character. And the actual words in the Greek there is homely intercourse. Think about homely's ugly, and you know what intercourse is. Now he's talking about intimate relationships. Ugly intercourse corrupts good character. Right? Ugly intercourse corrupts good character. Be careful of the deep intimate relationships that you have. Look, if it, it, it's hard enough that the whole world thinks that we're out of our mind. At least find some Christians to hang around with that believe God's word and that are going to help hold you accountable because we love one another. Right? You don't have to have homely intercourse. Hey, he's saying don't make out with the ugly people. You know, you knew I was going to go there. That's the language in the Greek. But he don't, he's not talking about physicality. He's not talking about your physical. He's talking about spiritually ugly people. There are a lot of spiritually ugly people. Some of them profess to be Christians and they're anything but. Because if, Christ, if you don't believe that Christ has been raised, you're still dead in your sins. And some of them may be saved, but they're just for common purposes. They're not in it. They're not in it with their whole heart. Stand if you would.